The human brain can hold 2,500 terabytes of data. How do we even visualize that? Historically, we would describe large amounts of digital information in terms of sheets of paper, like this photo of Bill Gates demonstrating how much data a CD-ROM can hold. Incidentally, this year marks the 40th anniversary of the CD-ROM, a storage format all but gone from common usage. So for comparison, you would need 3.7 million of these shiny disks to download your entire brain. Just about what you could find at 3.7 garage sales this weekend. Now why am I telling you all this? Initially, I wanted to make a video chronicling the interesting history of the CD-ROM on its 40th birthday, but it turns out that's not nearly as wild and sometimes X-rated as the history of all the different kinds of media storage over the years. So strap in. We've got sex, lies, and videotape, as well as some informative charts and graphs looking at the evolution of all this technology. Depending on how old you are, you'll remember having used one kind of storage, like a floppy disk or CD, and then at some point switching to the latest innovation, like the flash drive or CD. Or maybe, maybe you're old enough to have sat in a library, copied computer code out of a book onto an audio cassette, then took that cassette home, loaded that data onto a computer, and played a video game that you got out of a book at the library. That's a real thing. My dad used to do it. Regardless, we've all witnessed some form of data storage come and go in our lifetimes. When I was in fourth grade, CD-ROM was all the rage. You could hold an entire encyclopedia in the palm of your hand. Now, it's been 40 years since the CD-ROM was introduced, and in that time, we've actually seen other forms of storage completely come and go. Why do some things survive and others fade away? For instance, at the dawn of home video, two formats, VHS and Betamax, they were mud wrestling for a spot on top of your TV set. Now, most people have heard the story about how the adult film industry adopting VHS led to the format winning out over beta. Don't act surprised. You knew this stuff existed. But the truth of that battle, as with most things, is more complicated. Beta was in fact introduced a year before VHS. And initially, VHS tapes cost less and could hold twice as much video as Beta. On top of that, Sony fiercely controlled the licensing for Betamax hardware, and as usual, their death grip on their proprietary format allowed all the other manufacturers to offer a wider selection of VHS hardware at lower prices. And so, VHS won our hearts and minds by being widely available, cheaper, and holding more content. Now, Self-proclaimed Jesus of porn and part-time bridge troll Steve Hirsch. He's the one on the left. He's the guy who founded Vivid Entertainment back in 1984. He had said that back then, the lower cost of blank VHS tapes did actually contribute to porn producers putting out a larger share of content on VHS. But at the same time, Playboy Video Magazine was actually available on all common video formats in the 80s including Laserdisc, RCA's CED, Japanese VCD, as well as VHS and Beta. So while you could confidently say that adult content was the main driver of the early adoption of home video altogether, regardless of format, it can't take full credit for VHS's victory. In fact, here's an old order form for home video cassettes where they give you the option between VHS or Beta. Because prior to home video, if you wanted to watch an X-rated movie you had to go to an actual movie theater. And folks, the floors there are sticky for all the wrong reasons. By the way, the cost of bringing this vintage artwork home with you, $99 a tape, that's $420 today. Explains why these theaters didn't exactly disappear overnight. Anyway, that's probably the most salacious of the media format wars over the years. But even more intriguing is the big picture looking at all the major media formats since the dawn of computing. You can see a lot of interesting things here. For instance, something I'm calling time to kill. How long it takes for a new technology to render its predecessor undesirable by the consumer. As an example, it took nine years for the DVD format to finally kill off the VHS tape, after VHS fought so hard to put itself through college. Compared to the 20 years it took the CD to finally wipe out the audio cassette. Now, why is that? Why didn't we want to let go of the audio tape? 
maybe it was because we liked options or was it the MP3 that came on the scene in 2001 and finally kicked the cassette to the curb? This kind of outcome is a result of what I like to call the cost convenience curve. The sweet spot we want is to the right of that pink line there. And the cost in many cases will have to factor in not just the cost to you at the register, but the cost of whole industries having to adopt and adapt to a new format. CDs were convenient, but not so convenient that we wanted to shell out the cash to convert our entire audio collection. Also, jogging with a CD player was just a ridiculous endeavor. The only thing weirder would be like a hipster riding a penny farthing bike with headphones on. No, Kelly Clarkson! And there were also costs like the auto industry adopting the CD players before we could even begin to feel the convenience extend to our road trips and commutes to the office. Now, CD-ROM for data storage is still used, but its convenience score just continues to drop as it gets less and less convenient to borrow the external disk drive from your dad. So pretty soon it'll fully drift over that line there. And convenience in this sense also takes on a little extra meaning, like value added, versatility, and availability, not just does it make my life easier. Then we have outliers like the zip drive, the youngest death on this list, which everyone will tell you died because it had reliability issues. And it did, but it was really just a mild advancement of the existing floppy drive. Its moderate convenience was never going to match its cost. And let's be honest, it was about to be shoved out by solid state anyway. By the way, can we stop and look at the year 1999? What a time to be alive. Look at all the options we had. The lead up to Y2K must have been chaotic. And I mean like at the stores. I do not envy the Best Buy employees had to juggle all that. I actually tried to find someone who was there, but it was so long ago, there's no one around to tell the tale. It was before even this guy's time. And that's not even a joke. That's Bob Kaufman. In 2019, he was 89 years old and celebrating 15 years at Best Buy. According to LinkedIn, he's still there at 94, so that's off to you, sir. After that turning point in 2000, though, the pickings have gotten a little slim. Of the four major formats shown here, the two optical formats will likely die off first, leaving just solid state and hard disk. Kudos to hard disk, by the way. Been around since the 1950s. Super impressive run. I'm willing to bet we're not going to let it go anytime soon. It's far too reliable for bulk backups and so forth. And by the way, I'm not including the cloud in this conversation. It's a place, not really a medium. But outside of all that, are we not going to advance any further, explore new frontiers? Well, worry not. It turns out, as we've seen many times before, sci-fi movies have provided inspiration for innovations. Peter Kaczynski from the University of Southampton is the inventor of the 5D Memory Crystal, a concept featured in the original Superman movies, now brought to life. No clue when this will actually be ready for commercial use, so we don't know where it's going to land on the cost-convenience curve, but we'll see. Now, I'm not going all the way back to the early days of computing, but if this kind of stuff intrigues you, I highly recommend you look at some of the weird and wacky storage solutions that came out of like the 50s and 60s. Things like CRAM, these Mylar cards that held five and a half megabytes. I've left some links in the description below. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching this. I had a blast making it. If you enjoyed it, please give me a little thumbs up down there and uh, see you in the next one.